great to see everyone. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the summer and it's great to be back. So welcome back to the Profiles Breakfast Speaker Series. And we'd like to kick off our year and first and foremost, a thank you to the sponsors of our series, um, Kent State University Ashtabula, the Growth Partnership for Ashtabula County, Leadership Ashtabula County, and Gazette Newspapers. So thank you all for bringing this opportunity to Ashtabula County and throughout the course of the year. A big thank you as well to our new, uh, the new purveyors of our breakfast here. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. Um, it is from the folks at Mary's Diner who are actually also, also supplying the food here in the flash food here at Kent State University Ashtabula. So a huge welcome to them also. We're very appreciative to have them here. So our first speaker today, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to have here at Kent State University Ashtabula with us this morning, is Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen, the President and CEO of the Great Lakes Science Center. And the topic today is transforming education. We all have a responsibility to build our future workforce. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ellenbogen. Good morning. All right, can you hear in the back? Terrific. All right, and I'm not using slides, so keep eating your breakfast. Please enjoy. I didn't want you to have to look back and forth. Um, well, I was excited to get the invitation. I've been part of Leadership Cleveland, uh, where I'm based, and this was a great opportunity for me to get out here to Ashtabula. And uh, really, I've already enjoyed your coffee shops up here and, and seen the, a little beautiful strip of stores. So I am enjoying my very short visit, and I do help to have reasons to come back. Uh, and one of the things that often draws me out into a wide range of areas in our community is an understanding across Northeast Ohio that we're really struggling around workforce development. And one of the things I've found that is that there's a real divergence in the conversation happening between education and the corporations who are looking for that skilled workforce. So I want to talk a bit today uh, about what we're doing at the Science Center, how I got into this, where I see the connections between education and workforce, even at a very young age. Uh, and I want to start actually getting us thinking about children, right? If we're going to talk about education and workforce development, we should think about kids and how we support them and what kids are doing these days, right? So think with me for a moment about the last time you saw a child take a box of stuff say wires, switches, fuses, LEDs, batteries, right? And really make something from it. A nightlight, an underwater robotic vehicle, right? Have you seen someone do this lately? It's, it's not really something we see often. Uh, and it's something that we really value in the kind of technology we need for our future. Uh, I'll argue that these kinds of boxes of stuff, this kind of messing around, tinkering, this is really the kind of stuff that can change a child's life and can change our future. Let me explain a bit more. So in recent years, you've probably heard people talk about a big push for STEM, right? And as my father likes to say, what's this STEM stuff? Right, science, technology, engineering, and math, you'll see or hear some people say STEM, so science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. You'll hear some people say STEM C, uh, where you really call out computational science. But the idea is these integrated disciplines, because the usual disciplinary boundaries that we've had in the past don't work as well in what we're looking at these days. But what you hear a lot about with STEM education is that we're trailing other countries. And this is not just about, well, we should be more like Finnish education. This is a very serious alarm that's gone off in the United States to say uh, we're trailing countries like Mexico, Canada, many European and Asian nations in really developing a STEM workforce. We know, uh, if you look at all the data, it's very clear that most jobs in the near future, so even within the next 10 years, will require a significant amount of STEM skills. So if you look at data from the US Department of Labor, uh, you can get the list of the 20 fastest growing occupations projected. Uh, of those 20, 15 of them require significant STEM preparation. So here in Northeast Ohio, right, where we have 
a large history of making things, of being an entrepreneurial region, right? This causes a great deal of alarm, right? What are we doing to really make sure that we're educating the youth of today to create the jobs of the future? So I want to tell you a bit about what we're working on at Great Lakes Science Center uh, and how we support STEM education. But when I think about education, uh, and hopefully you do this too, you spend some time thinking about your own life's journey in education. Because certainly when I look at my children now, uh, I have a 9 and 11 year old, um, and I look at the immediate options available for them and the kinds of things they're exposed to uh, both on computers or on the television or just when I go looking for things for them to play with, right? There's a lot of black box approach to technology, right? So there's, there's very, it's actually very difficult now to do some of the things, certainly I did growing up, right, where you took things apart. Right? Uh, I grew up uh, with a passion for tinkering, and that comes from a childhood where messing around with technology was not just allowed, but it was expected. Um, you know, I grew up with six brothers, one sister, and a big kid's workbench in the basement, right? And I'm sure some of you grew up this way also. So there's a big pile of lumber just for the kids. Don't touch the good lumber, right? And, uh, and we were allowed to saw and drill and nail, right? These were very basic skills. But again, today at the Science Center, we find we're often teaching children how to use a screwdriver, right? Their first time using it all, we're introducing them to basic tool use. And it really makes me sort of think about, okay, so what experiences did we have? Um, certainly, you know, when I look today and I look to get circuitry for my children, there's snap circuit kits. Like, well, but then I'm not gonna teach you soldering, right? So it's not, it's not the same as the breadboard that you might have grown up playing with. Um, you know, crystals, my kids grow crystal out of borax, which is fine, it's great. Uh, but if you look back at what you might have done growing up, right, there, you, had a, you could get chemicals, all sorts of wonderful things, and grow bright blue crystals, do terrific things, because we had access to things and there was an expectation for this kind of messing around and through that discovering your own passions. So I'm gonna argue that really our future, and if we want to change our future and make this more positive, we really have to help the children in our life develop this wonder and passion for messing around. Uh, because truly advancing our economy starts with that. Now we know in Northeast Ohio uh, that we are a hub for advanced manufacturing. Uh, it looks nothing like the factories I grew up with in Detroit. Uh, we used to always take, you know, annual field trip. We, I grew up near River Rouge um, factory, which is a very, very famous, very important uh, piece of anybody's manufacturing history, but certainly Detroit's. And people would shout from the line, you know, you were doing the tour on the side behind the yellow line, but they'd shout from the working line and say, you know, stay in school, right? You don't want this job. And when you saw some of the conditions that they were working in, you thought, yeah, that's not for me, right? I don't want to be involved in any of that. But how many of you have had the chance, have had the chance recently to look at what advanced manufacturing looks like today, right? It looks like sitting down to a computer in many of the factories that I'm at. It looks very, very different, right? Um, and I work a lot with Lincoln Electric, Lubrizol, Parker Hannafin, these kinds of organizations, right? They're on the board of the Science Center and we spend a lot of time talking about these issues. Uh, so we really say at Great Lakes Science Center that the solution to this is thinking about ourselves as part of an educational ecosystem. Now, this ecosystem is largely invisible right now. It's, it's not something that most communities have mapped out. It's not something you can immediately point to and say, here's the ecosystem working together to make change in our community. Um, but I'll argue that it's the most powerful mechanism we have for actually leveraging change around education, creating talent in our rural areas and in our urban care, in our urban core. Um, this is where a stronger workforce will come from. Uh, the idea of an ecosystem is, is really about changing where we view the responsibility and the ability to change how people learn and, and where people access education. 
So at the Science Center, for example, this comes up because most people think about us as a fun place to come on the weekend and bring your family, right? Most people know us for our exhibits, and I could go on and on about some of our new exhibits at the Science Center and entice you to come to those. Um, but I'd rather, for this community, spend more time talking about all the other things we do, right? So our educational programs reach almost 200,000 people a year, mostly children. Um, we also conduct professional development for teachers. We have summer camps in six locations around the region. And we're home to a school, MC Squared STEM. We have the ninth grade of that school. And they just received the Excellence in Innovation Secondary School Award. Uh, but also recently, they were recognized for uh, pretty much eliminating the achievement gap, which means that the students who, have, who are coming from the lowest income families and with the greatest needs in that school are achieving at the same level as the students who come in uh, with a high income in their household or a lot of resources in their home. So they really uh, bridge that, what we typically call the achievement gap. We also have at the Science Center an after school program called Great Science Academy. And this is a program where we do give every child a box of stuff, right? This is our most intensive program. So the box of stuff, for example, well, let me talk about the program first. The program itself is designed as an after school program or an out of school time program, right? And you think of this typically of how you work with your local libraries, how you work with local youth ministry groups. Um, where do people, where do children spend their time? time outside of school. And we've launched, uh, it's a program for grades 6 through 11. It's growing one grade each year. So now we have grades 6 through, it's 6 through 11 right now, and it'll grow next year to 6 through 12. Uh, youth spend every other Saturday at the Science Center, and then they spend time with us more intensively over the summer, and they go on numerous field experiences with us. Uh, we spend more than 200 hours a year with each child in this program. So it is by far our most intensive experience with youth in the community. And in the program, they work over days and weeks and months to solve in-depth challenges that emphasize collaboration, creative thinking, confidence, and they build their own solutions to these problems. Uh, and some of it involves, for example, taking that box of stuff, right? And in this case, turning it into an underwater robotic vehicle. They start with wires, switches, fuses, batteries, and after a few months, they've cut, framed, soldered, wired, waterproofed, and programmed their robot and the remote control um, that allows them to move it through a body of water. And we start them with a little tub of water, we move them to a pool, and by the end, they go out the back door of the Science Center, and they're putting that underwater robotic vehicle into Lake Erie and running a course through Lake Erie. So our education programs are more than just having fun. But believe me, we're, we're very much about that. Um, but we do spark an interest, and we spark a lifelong interest in STEM careers. This is critical, and really, by the time I get to the end of this, what I'm going to argue is, is that uh, it's truly the most important thing that any one of us can do is to spark an interest in a STEM career around ages 9 to 12. If you manage to spark an interest in a STEM career around that age, that child is going to be three times more likely than their peer to actually successfully enter a STEM career. And there's been terrific longitudinal research on this. And it's a shocking thing to see, right? Because I grew up with a lot of research on, uh, you know, it makes a difference. Uh, the household income, the career of the parents, you have to take algebra by eighth grade, right? There's been a lot of time spent in science education around really emphasizing these things. But it turns out one of the best predictors is really sparking that interest at a young age. And that kind of shifts how we think about workforce development and how we collaborate uh, between corporations and schools because that's a much younger age than we typically think of in thinking about workforce development. So what does this mean for the concept of an educational ecosystem? Well, it means that learning is not centered around any one type of educational institution. Um, when I did my doctorate some, some years ago now, uh, I actually focused on families and how families learned. And I focused on looking at how they spent time together learning as a family unit. So that meant times that they spent in museums, 
They'd call me up when they were going to go to a museum, and I'd, I'd go meet them there, and I'd record their conversation there. And I'd record their conversation in the car on the way home. Uh, I'd record them over dinner time, homework time. Uh, one family, I said, well, where do you spend time together as a family? Where do you talk as a family? The barber shop. Right? They had four little boys. They all went to the barber shop once a month and got a trim. Great. So I went to the barber shop, right? And, and they just got used to, over the course of 18 months, spending a lot of times with little recording devices, capturing their conversations. And one of the powerful things that I found was that the family ends up really having control over the learning environment. And for someone who works in, an, in a field where we design environments to control learning, right, it's, it's the whole magic of science centers and other kinds of museums. We specifically design the environment from the lighting and the ambient sound to how things are placed to the shape of the table we use in our exhibits. All of that's designed to support learning. And for better or for worse, one of the things I found is that the family will truly hijack any of those situations you design towards what they're interested in learning about or towards their past history, right? So I can spend all this time designing an exhibit uh, that provides a perfect context for meteors, but when the family comes through and they see the meteor and they say, that looks just like the meteor that fell on Uncle Ed's farm. Do you remember that? Do you remember when we went out to see that, right? And then the conversation goes this way, right? Even though I designed everything to go that way. Um, that families really have a huge amount of control over those learning moments. Um, and you start to see that actually this affects schools. Uh, so later, after that study, I was able to follow this up with some um, recording and observations in schools. And that kind of family control of expectations around conversations uh, and what people got out of these learning moments really was traceable back to a lot of those family conversations in the home. So it's, uh, it's a it's much more of a situation of really looking at the learning group itself. Uh, another thing that we found is that when you put the learner in the center, right, so following the family, following the child, and looking at where that child is going over the course of a week or a month or a year, it really starts to shift where you think, not only where you think about learning happening, but where in your life, right? And as adults, we are learners. And you can even think back, I'm sure we could go around and start to say all the places where you've learned as an adult, right? And when you look at the amount of time that a child spends learning in school over the course of a lifetime, when you start comparing those, well, the numbers get a little depressing. And I only say that as someone who works um, very diligently supporting our school system, and my husband is a public school teacher. Uh, but when you look at the amount of time that schools actually have access to the child, it turns out to be not so much, right? So if you take about 16 waking hours and then look across a lifespan, kindergarten through 12th grade takes up less than 20% of your waking hours through those years. Now, that's not to say that schools are not critical. It's not to say that schools are not a huge part of the formative part of a child's life. But there's, I mean, frankly, I'm impressed that schools achieve so much given that they get only this slice, right, of a child's life. Now, a lot of this comes from that zero to five age range when a child is not typically in a school environment. And it's why there's so much passion and energy now around supporting our youngest citizens and really figuring out what you do in that zero to five age group. Um, but even when you look across a lifespan, formal education tends to account for only about 5% of a person's life when you look over time. Another thing we start to find when you look at ecosystems is that uh, an educational ecosystem looks like a pathway, not a pipeline. And some of this is about semantics, um, but it's, it's very important semantics in the sense that the more we talk about pipelines and expect that there's some sort of straight and narrow path that we're going to put youth on into these STEM careers, into the kind of STEM skills we need for a wide range of careers, even if we don't think of them typically as a STEM career. The pipeline, first of all, it means there's one entry point usually. 
It means it's usually very a, a leaky pipeline, right? And in the end, it just doesn't match what you see when you put the learner in the center and start following that learner, right? You start to see a lot more of these pathways. So all the out-of-school time organizations, such as your libraries, your Boys and Girls Club, the after-school program at the Housing Authority or at the local church, the Y, the community centers, all sorts of youth groups and scouting. Um, there's also the corporations, right, providing mentorships and other kinds of programming that this ecosystem, right, is really very big. And as a child moves through all these different learning opportunities and learning moments, right, it's much more of a, frankly, a wandering pathway than it is a pipeline. And the more time we spend actually trying to map out a pathway approach to STEM careers, the more accessible we're going to seem, right? Pathways give you lots of entry points, right? It, it's a much more understanding way of saying, look, in this day and age, if you, if you start to track even our oldest millennials, the changing jobs every three years and things like that, it starts to really accommodate that kind of cultural expectation that you see as generations shift over time. And it makes it much more welcoming to say, well, sure, you may be moving out of that job, but there's a pathway that can get you all the way over here to this job also. Uh, and that's a lot harder to do when we talk about pipelines, frankly. Uh, so if we take this ecosystem approach, how does it actually change what we're doing? Well, first of all, it changes control and value and power. And these are very big things. I mean, if, if you're coming together to talk about leadership, you're talking about power. And this is very important that a community really step back and say, OK, if the control is not always with schools for education, but instead is something that resides in a broader community perspective, right? then what's our responsibility towards this? And how do we really make sure that we're all contributing as part of this educational ecosystem? Um, I look often at my mother's own very wandering pathway over time. She grew up on the west side of Cleveland. It's a block now that's called Hingetown, if you've been in that area. And when she talks about her formative years, that, that I really push her to talk about because she actually works in computer science, right? And for a woman her age, I've promised her I'm not going to actually say what that age is. Um, but let me just say, if I'm approaching 50, she's approaching, right? And I'm not the oldest in my family. So, so for a woman of her age to be in IT, well, that's a very, very odd thing. And when I've asked her about that, like, how'd that happen, right? Um, she really talks about uh, the wonderful experience she had growing up going to Lord's Academy. Uh, and some of you who are longtime Northeast Ohio uh, residents, you may know about this terrific, terrific school. It's, it doesn't exist anymore. There's a large rock, actually, that we've gone to um, visit that marks this school. And she talks about extraordinary learning experiences that she had at Lord's and how it really encouraged her to have an interest in science. But when I've pushed her and said like, oh great, so it's something that a teacher said to you, right? Or how'd you get from liking chemistry at Lord's to an IT career? She, she came back to me and she said, actually it was Berta Mae Blackburn. Who's Berta Mae Blackburn? Berta Mae Blackburn is the librarian at the Lorraine branch of the library, uh, just off Fulton Road, who introduced her to science fiction. And when she talks about her love of computer science, it came from the books that she read because her librarian said, yeah. okay, you've read this and this and this. You should really, right? There's this thing called science fiction. You're gonna love these books. And really, literally opened up her world and changed her life. Uh, she moved from liking chemistry and loving the science fiction into an after-school job and then a summer job while she was in college at Standard Oil. And that came, again, because a neighbor down the street worked at Standard Oil and said, hey, you know, you can actually get these summer jobs. You would enjoy doing this, right? So when, when she talks about how a first-generation college student like herself got interest in science and technology and specific computers in the 50s, it's, it's a very broad story, right? So when we think about addressing a skills gap that we have in Northeast Ohio, we, we can't just think about schools, 
right? Uh, another impact of taking an ecosystem approach is alignment. And, and believe me, I can come and work with your group about this. I spend lots and lots of time talking about alignment. It's been very powerful for some of the conversations we're having in Cleveland. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I come out of science education. I mean, I worked in neuroimmunology in a multiple sclerosis clinic. I, I do have a STEM background, but really my doctorate's in STEM education. That's been my focus now for many, many years. And in STEM education, we talk a lot about problem solving problem-based learning, right? If you are in education circles and hang out with people who do science education, you're gonna hear a lot of conversation around this, right? Project-based learning, problem-based learning, but a lot about problem solving. Well, when we sat down at the Science Center and brought together local corporations like Parker, Lincoln Electric, Eaton, the ones that tell me that they have, in some instances, hundreds of jobs unfilled, hundreds hundreds of jobs unfilled because they can't find the skilled labor they need to fill those positions. And some of these are entry level positions, right? These are not extreme skills, but, but they're having trouble filling these positions. And we really got into what are the skills you need. It turns out that all of this conversation that we've been having in STEM education around problem solving really missed what the corporations were talking about because they said, you know that problem solving thing you always talk about? That's not so much what we need. We're looking for problem identification as a skill. So what are you talking about? I said, look, if, if all I need to do is bring someone into a space and say, okay, we've identified the problem, here are all the resources you have to solve it, and look, if you need something else, you let us know, right? But here's the problem, go solve it. Well, they've got plenty of people with that skill. They have plenty of people they can hire, and they would not be in a workforce shortage right now if that was the issue. The problem they say they're running into is that they, most of the time, when they pull that person in the room and say, hey, I need you to work on this, they don't know what the problem is. They know that something down the line is not working. They don't actually know where the problem is. They don't know exactly that source of here's what needs to be solved for. And when they put people in the room, or sort of say, have at it, it's this whole thing, we're not sure where the problem is, figure out where the problem is, that's where they really come to a skills shortage. People get dumbstruck. They just have trouble figuring out, how am I gonna narrow this down? We've got these big, messy systems now that run the world, not just run the world, run a small individual corporation, have them walk you through how all these pieces and parts come together to get where they need in the end. Let me tell you, it's gonna be messy, right? There are gonna be a lot of interconnected pieces. And again, if you talk about leadership, you've probably thought about systems and the fact that there's not straight and narrow lines, but all of these things interconnected make up the workplace and the kind of workforce we need. So we've changed our conversation at Great Lakes Science Center, and we actually talk about this in a group that gets together in Cleveland uh, that calls itself, we call ourselves the STEM ecosystem, and we get together across all these organizations. And we've really shifted, certainly at the Science Center, to say we're reducing our emphasis on problem solving and instead really focusing on problem identification as a skill. And the amazing thing is, is when I sat down with my education team and really said, these are new marching orders. I know there's not a lot of literature on this, but I need you to focus on this as a learning outcome. It really shifted the way we designed our programs. So, and, and that's something now we hear from the corporations, right? We've only been doing that for about a year and a half now, but the corporations are very, very excited about this. And when we say, look, I've stepped back and changed my curriculum entirely at the Science Center, well, now they see us as a partner. Now they truly see us as a partner at the Science Center. So I wanna talk uh, just a few more minutes and say what's another thing you get from the ecosystem approach, and this is near and dear to my heart certainly growing up in Detroit and working in Cleveland, is that when you take an ecosystem approach, it starts to really change the conversation around access and equity. Right, and you know when you're working in a rural area, when you have families and children coming in who just didn't have resources uh, that other families with a higher household income, um, with greater resources, right? We have an opportunity in Northeast Ohio to really level the playing field in a different kind of way, right? And you can look at this 
from many different points of view, but we have got, certainly in Cleveland, there's an urban core of our youth that's really untapped. Statistically speaking, right, there are going, the next Garrett Morgan is sitting somewhere in Cleveland, right, and, and they're going to be a terrific entrepreneur and inventor if only we help them with the pathways and the access they need. You can say the same thing. You know how the population is spread out in rural areas and with our partners who work most strongly in rural areas. They say this all the time. Somewhere out there, down that road, right, where we send our school buses way out to get that child, make sure they're included, right, is the next Steve Jobs, right? Because we know that the next Steve Jobs is not going to be a white man in a black turtleneck, right? So how are we making sure, right, as we open our doors and say, it's not a singular pipeline, it's this pathway, it really does start to change all the different access points we provide and shifts the many different ways that any child gets access to the skilled workforce development that they need. Uh, so I do want to talk a bit about then what you can do for closing up. Uh, this idea of helping young, child, young children in all of our lives build their identity, right? The, the moment of saying, right, and this gets back to my point about, well, that child between the ages of 9 and 12 who gets an interest in a STEM career, they're three times more likely than their peer to actually end up successfully in that STEM career. That's your job. It's our job. It's every one of us, right? When was the last time that you talked to a child in your life, that may be your own child, that may be your grandchild, that may be the neighbor down the street, right? It may be the kid that comes over every time there's you know, a bad storm and says, hey, can I shovel your walk, right? The child that takes the extra step. When was the last time you sat down with a child like that and said, you know, you've got something. You know, your interest in this, or the way you approach that, or what you said the other day, or I love the way you really dig into this work. When was the last time you sat down with that child and said, you know, you could try a career in this, right? And started to open up their world, right, about all the different options that they might have. A lot of times when you talk to someone about, hey, how'd you end up doing that very cool thing you do? It's because someone tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, have you thought about this? Did you know that this was an option? We tend to wait for those things until high school, right? Every corporation I work with does some sort of mentoring or tours or internships with high school students or college students. Very, very few of them are really taking the easy, and it is easier at that age, position of trying to spark an interest in that younger children. And so that has to come through us tapping that child on the shoulder. Second thing you can do, we can all do, is make the educational ecosystem more visible. What do I mean by that? Well, the tendency is to talk about, well, we're going to create this cluster and we're going to bring together these certain corporations that all need this kind of workforce skill and we're going to work together in that cluster. Uh, you'll see the same thing. Educational organizations will get together and they'll say, okay, well, all the higher education organizations are going to come together in the community. And they're really going to have a deep, meaningful conversation. But we think in these preset clusters, right? If we start to say, when you have control over a meeting, right, when you have an opportunity to really set the agenda or invite people to the table, are you inviting people from the ecosystem, right? So when I have education meetings now at the Science Center, corporations are always at the table. We don't have meetings about STEM education without having the corporations who really play a role in helping us understand what the skills are needed in our community. We don't have that meeting without the corporation at the table. If you're a corporation and you're talking about skill development, do you really do that without educators in the room, right? You have control over this situation and you do have an opportunity all the time to say, you know, the library is going to come to this. I'm bringing my local youth minister. When you think about the most influential people in your community, unfortunately, it's not the parents. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's also usually not the teachers. It's the football coaches, right? It's the youth minister, right? The, the, when you look at who influences children at the age that we're really trying to get them around 9 to 12, it's usually not as much the parent as we would want it to be. So are you including them, right? I've done workshops for football coaches because I know if I want that kid to get into this program, the football coach 
it's 10 times more likely to convince them than I am. So who are those influences? Who's part of your ecosystem? Change your invitation list. The third and final thing I want to talk about is looking for alignment. This is very powerful. I gave you one example of really shifting how we talk about you know, de-emphasizing problem solving and really pushing more on problem identification. But we've done this in a dozen different ways at the Science Center. Um, in Cleveland, we have the luxury of having many, many cultural institutions that focus on science, right? It's a, it's a terrific thing with a very long history of having the Natural History Museum, the aquarium, the zoo, the botanic garden, multiple nature centers that are very high quality, um, our arboretum, right? We all could really be stepping on each other's toes. And in fact, I will admit that in the past, my organization, a natural history museum, explicitly went head to head. We'd book things that directly, directly tried to take business from our other cultural arts partners. Well, it turns out now that most, all but two of the STEM-related museums in the community, and frankly, most of the museums in Cleveland, have a new CEO that's come in in the last five years. And it's really shifted the dynamic. So we get together on a regular basis. We have a little email list where we can shoot quick questions out. We share data. Uh, we share a lot of information. And one of the things we realized we needed to share was our program planning. And so we took something like water, right? In Ashtabula, just like in Cleveland, you, you cannot talk about STEM education without talking about that big, 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 big blue thing in our backyard, right? So water is critical. Every science-related cultural institution in Cleveland talks about water in some form or another. When we brought everyone together in the room and mapped out on a giant wall what everyone's doing around water, <laughs> Big surprise. Turns out we were directly competing with each other. There were 10 of us doing this thing over here. Nobody doing this other really core key area over here. And meanwhile, we had forgotten this age group, right? So when we sat down and said, here are all the ages from you know, infant to adult. Here are all the kind of core competencies that people really need to understand around everything from just the basic biology of water and the chemistry of water to water technology and building water filters. What's everyone doing around that? Well, we started to find that there were niches that we could occupy. The Science Center was an excellent example. Big surprise, shouldn't have been a surprise. We're the only one who talk about water technology, right? For all the other places, they're focused much more on environmental sciences, but we're the only one who really gets at the engineering and the technology. So we've shifted our water education programs. We'll directly reference uh, what's going on at Natural History. Look, if you need this kind of thing, go to the Natural History Museum. But if you want to know how to clean your water, how to build a water filter, right, all of this work with the sewer district, you can come and create those things at the Science Center. So we work much more around that alignment and saying, okay, we're not going to duplicate. We're going to work hard to really have a shared understanding of what we mean by these terms. And, and it changes things in our community. It actually changes things quickly. We hear from the school districts that this has been a huge boost to them. And, and frankly, again, it's about making the ecosystem visible, but it's also about really aligning and admitting that we need to do this more together. So please take this list. I mean, I hope that tapping the child on the shoulder um, really making sure that you make that ecosystem visible, change who you're inviting to the table, and then really thinking hard about alignment. And believe me, it's hard. It means you have to take your organizational priorities, set them aside, and have a pretty open conversation about what the community needs and how you're providing that. So I want to leave it at that. I know I've gone to nine, and so we may only have just a couple minutes for questions. But thank you so much for bringing me here today. Uh, sure. At Severance Hall, a lady asked during intermission, where do you live? And I said, Ashtabula. And she said, oh my, are you staying all night? <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to tell you, we have a group of young people in our county that are being raised under that same idea of locating the problem and solving it. And they are our farm family kids. Um, I'm amazed always that the farmers that we have in our congregation and something happens at the church and I don't know how to fix it and they will locate the problem and usually repair it on their own. Uh, they're a great group of kids, um, very well motivated and uh, 
So maybe we can tap into that a little bit as well. They are the problem finders and solvers that we have. I wholeheartedly agree. One of the things when you get into national meetings that comes up very quickly, 4-H um, and the work that is done in rural communities uh, is probably the greatest example of terrific STEM education we have in this nation. They're ahead of the game in how they evaluate their programs and how they design their programs uh, and their model for every one of us. And they really have understood how to take um, the terrific work that happens in a farming community and build on that to create very powerful STEM education. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to following up with some of you. We left a few materials at the back, but don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kirsten. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, a few announcements as well. Uh, for next month, you may have uh, noted at the door, we do have our fall schedule um, available as well. But next month, our speaker on October 5th, 5th um, is Bobby Ina, um, who is pretty well known in the Cleveland and Northeast Ohio region. Um, he's been featured on WKYC and a few other channels as a political pundit of sorts, uh, nonpartisan. But he's going to talk about um, the 2016 presidential election, the Electoral College, its significance, and what can we predict for an outcome? We thought we'd mix it up a little bit and talk about this subject uh, from a nonpartisan standpoint, but what it looks like um, from our and how that impacts us here in Northeast Ohio. And um, Bobby is uh, the, from Met Metropolis Consulting, and they have worked on close to over 70 local and state level um, elections as lobbyists and um, you know, just uh, consultants and that sort of thing. Um, so we're looking forward to next month as well, and we hope we'll see all of you there. So thank you all for being here. And again, um, thank you very much, Kirsten. It was absolutely excellent. So have a great day.